And there's, there's the intro, and I am back. So thanks again for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk this afternoon about new technologies and new learning experiences and uh, how we can look toward the future and use technology in some different ways. So some of the themes that we've followed throughout the conference, uh, but maybe in a little bit more detail and with some of the, some of the themes behind it. So let me start with a story. Um, there's an old story that seemingly everyone who tells a story says it's happened to them. I'm not going to say that. It did not happen to me, but I've heard it many, many times. Many, many people, every one of whom says it happened to them. Uh, this, I, I, so I don't believe them, but it's still a worthwhile story. The story is the following. Um, it's about a woman. It could be a man. It's about a woman who is um, putting a roast in the oven. And the way that she cooks the roast is by first cutting off the end of the roast and then putting the rest in the oven which seems really strange because you're wasting a lot of the, of the meat. You cut this off, she kind of throws it away. So you can see here, there's just an end of the, of the roast that's missing and you might wonder why that was. So she was asked why that was and said, well, that's the way my mother taught me. That's how I do it. Okay, it's an explanation. You learn from the people you know, who, who've taught you, but somehow this wasn't really a question. So went to her mother, asked her, why is it that you cut the ends off the roast before you put it in the oven. What, what's the purpose of that? And she said, I, it's what my mother taught me. I, I really couldn't tell you. So they went to the, her mother, so the grandmother of our original person in the story, who says, and they said, well, why do you, you know, why cut the ends off that you're just, aren't you just wasting perfectly good meat? And she said, well, when I grew up and learned to cook, we had a really small oven and I could never fit the entire roast in it unless I cut the ends off and that's why I do it. So that's the story. And the purpose of the story, you know, is there's a tradition that was carried on that wasn't a tradition that needed to be, right? I'm all for tradition. I really enjoy tradition. But there's, that's not a tradition that needed to be unexamined. The reasons behind it didn't make any sense anymore in the modern world. Um, they made sense at the time, and it just got passed down without uh, being examined. You know, following what Antonella said this morning, the, you know, the, the unexamined life is not worth living. This is maybe not exactly life, but it's a, it is a, a key principle. So here we are in a time of change. And we are in a significant time of change, um, you know, particularly in ways that can affect our work in learning and development and in education. Uh, generally, new technological changes bring us new methods of interaction. Uh, so I think that's where the great opportunities lie in terms of what we can do to reimagine and reinvent education. So we have new technology. We have, first we had mobile technology. We have virtual reality. We have augmented reality. We have holograms. We have so many more things that we can use. And when we do so, we want to think about what can we use them best for, right? We don't want to just translate the old methods into the new technology, but think about what can we do that's going to be different, uh, cast off old limitations, think about, you know, from scratch, where would we be? So if we were in a position of cooking the roast and we we're seeing a roast for the first time, how would we do it with the world that we're in and try to, you know, separate ourselves momentarily from the past? So it's kind of a funny line because on one hand, you want to learn from the past, you want to learn not only from mistakes, but from the good things. You want to follow traditions that are good traditions, but you want to re-examine things and think about what can we do differently. And we are in a very different world now than we were uh, some time ago. So the goal really is to not try to replicate some of the learning methods that have evolved over the years necessarily, but to take the right parts of those and the right research behind them. And some of the things that we've seen, learning by doing, active learning, coaching and all that, and create new experiences that are built around the technology that we have today. Historically, as we see technology change, we see new methods of interaction. So there are, you know, a lot of other things that happen when technology changes. But if we look back at the history, you know, one point we had radio and that gave us sound. We could have sound portably anywhere, or at least anywhere, you know, first everywhere with an outlet and electrical outlet than anywhere at all. Um, this was before my time, in case you were wondering. Um, television, we had video, right, right in your home. Uh, you know, no longer did you have to go to the movie theater, you had video right there in your home, and that was a big technological advance. But again, you had to kind of think about, well, what can you do differently with video? Some of the early TV programs uh, were, you know, again, before my time, but more like radio programs, where they would just be talking and you would see the person who was talking, but it wasn't much more. It took some time for things to get reimagined and, and to evolve fully. One of the later, uh, later technological advances, the VCR, uh, and this gave us, among other things, time shifting, fast forwarding, rewind, replay. So, you know, with TV, you can watch what was on TV. That was your choice. If you like one of the channels, that's it. If you don't like one of the channels, go do something else. 
with the VCR, you had a level of control, right? So you can you can watch what you want when you want, as long as you remember to record it in the first place. But still a big step. Video games were another big interface step. Um, the joystick and other interfaces, different types of user control, uh, different types of interactivity. So you know the VCR was sort of a level of interactivity, but not much. You know, radio you change the station, TV you change the channel, the volume I guess for both of those. Um, VCRs, you can do a little bit more, but then with uh, some of the video game stuff, you're really interacting much more substantially. Um, later on, I started to get computers at home. Um, you know, when computers already existed, but you're starting to really get them in the mainstream. Uh, you know, keyboard and the mouse and so much more, graphical user interfaces, all sorts of things. Next major one is probably smartphones and tablets uh, with mobility and touch and multi-touch. Um, you know, Portable audio came along, you know, was was there with radio and was there with the Sony Walkman, and then became sort of even more prevalent with uh, MP3. So there's so many so many different parts of this, but um, each technological advance gave us new opportunities. And some of the early early e-learning we saw on mobile phones did not take advantage of that. We saw a lot of early e-learning that looked like um, the learning that you might get in a classroom, or that might look like the learning that you would get on a computer, but scaled down to a small screen and, and not all that usable. So again, reimagining what can you do with the technology, and that's, I think, where the, you know, where the beauty is and where the opportunities are. So for example, take a look at virtual reality. Um, you know, imagine an educational simulation. We've seen some bits and pieces of educational simulations, um, both in Fernando's talk in a sort of you know, 3D environment. We saw some this morning, um, some of the online ones that, that I showed. And imagine those in a VR environment. Imagine those in virtual reality where you're doing something, you have some kind of guidance and feedback. It's a realistic feeling and you're immersed in the world much more than, than we even were watching, um, you know, the videos or watching um, Moira and James this morning. We were paying attention to their situation, but we weren't fully immersed. It's on a screen. It's not everything that's going on with us. They're not fully in 3D. They're really in great video, but that's, that's all it is. So imagine that and then imagine further if you have full motion control. Right, so you could actually control things. We, we saw the example this morning where you were sorting money and uh, making change. So you were picking the bills and the, and the coins out of the drawer. Imagine if you could actually feel more as if you were doing that. You reach out and it feels like you're, you're doing something. Touch is another issue, but at the very least, imagine if you could control the, the dollar signs or the dollars, I guess, themselves by, uh, you know, by reaching out and picking one uh, and handing something to a customer. Any of these things could work. So if we design the right situations to take advantage of virtual reality, we really have something we can do that's, that's a, a level of simulation beyond what you can do with a computer. Here's a survey from the eLearning Guild here in the US um, that uh, is kind of just worth looking at. This is a survey from about a year ago where organizations were asked, do you see opportunities for your organization to use VR in the future? So there's a lot of interest. 64.5% said yes. Uh, it, it's going to take time. I think, you know, if you ask that question today, we probably would still see the same yeses. Uh, I don't know that we would see a tremendous number who are already using it. And if any of you are, that would be uh, absolutely great to, you know, great to hear about it in the Q&A session. Um, but, you know, what I've seen out with my clients so far and, and out in the world is not, is much more talk and plans, but the plans are definitely there. And VR is becoming a step more mainstream. We saw with Michelle Cortez's talk, uh, interview and, and her demo yesterday. Um, for those of you who missed it, she's a uh, Facebook VR designer who teaches a course at NYU, New York University, for drama students, for theater students, uh, where they produce performances in VR um, that run on the Oculus Quest, which is a standalone powerful headset, which is the latest version. And they're really, really good, and they're really phenomenally interesting. And we, we got to see the, some, some demos and uh, some of the behind the scenes activities and all kinds of things. It was uh, a lot of fun to see what they're doing. And now they, you know, it gives you sort of just a, a sign that the Quest is coming to, to become a little bit more mainstream. They're not overly expensive. They're something that people can get. They're not gonna be in every home and every office, but it's a step closer than we've been before. All right. Augmented reality, uh, another technology, you know, we, particularly good for just-in-time things. Maybe we don't need training for a lot of things, right? Here's a new version of, of Google Maps that's more than, uh, you know, sort of what the, the version, at least, that runs on, on my version of Android uh, is right now, which gives me the maps, which is nice, but this points out uh, things that are, are coming near you. It shows you a 3D view of where you are. Um, the more you can do with augmented reality, the less you might need training on the job, right? So if you're working in a particular job and it involves 
um, something that you can do just in time. You don't have to learn in advance. Uh, that's obviously much better. And AR, among other things, is great potentially for that. Companies are also interested in augmented reality. A uh, question from the Learning Guild there was actually higher, uh, although I don't think uh, necessarily significantly higher, than the VR. So are, are you, than the VR number. So are you going to use AR? 70.8% said yes. And that would be, you know, that would be great to see. And, and for this to become more, more mainstream technology. And again, the question is for us as, you know, as the learning field and as the education field, as the designers to think about what can we do that's really going to take advantage of the new technology. So it's again, great to have it, but what can we re-envision that's going to take, make use of it? And uh, so much interest in that at all at this, at this time. Holograms, uh, another one where you can do some 3D projections. We saw with Fernando, um, even more realistic. Um, some things right now need space, physical rooms. Uh, holograms always need rooms of, you know, what if you could project in your house and it would, you know, be smart enough that it wouldn't really need quite a, you know, a plain white room uh, for you to be in when, when it's not gone, which would not be a good way to live uh, the rest of the time. So there are things to, things to look at, lots more we can do. Artificial intelligence, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, later this afternoon in a mini talk um, at 3.05. Uh, AI can mean a lot of different things, and there's been a lot of talk about what you know, AI is, what it will mean in education, what can it mean. Uh, Ryan Baker talked about learning analytics, and there's some AI uh, techniques certainly in that and in managing big data. Uh, the idea of using analytics for adaptive learning, for personalized learning, all of that counts as AI. And to me, that's a big part of the experience. What we want to do is, is look at ways to use AI techniques to improve the experience, to help pe help coach people, to help give them more say in the decision, in the um, experiences that they have, and to create experiences that really feel much more realistic. So uh, we're not really, to me, looking at the idea of a, you know, of a full-fledged, fully functional humanoid robot who's your teacher, but rather, where do we take these AI techniques and put them into practice uh, in, in the context of education? And that's been an area that I, I some of you know, I've worked in for, for quite some time um, since the uh, late 80s and early 90s with educational simulations that used uh, AI techniques. There's a lot more to go and more technologies that come out seemingly, you know, all the time or might get more and more popular or more and more useful. Um, you know, we have smartwatches, we have uh, Echo, we have 5G networks now getting a little bit more prevalent. We have foldable devices uh, coming, at, at, you know, coming and going, but eventually coming, I think, for good. Uh, the last one is a headset that monitors your brain, brain waves by a company called Emotive, and it uh, you can interact with your computer based on your brain waves. Now, this does raise issues in terms of comfort and privacy, and it certainly does for me. I don't know that I'd immediately be comfortable wearing that and having you know my computer knowing what you know what I appear to be thinking in any way, shape, or form. But there's something to that, and you know, can we sense, for example, in a customer service situation simulation that you're getting angry? Can we sense it from your tone? Maybe if we have you speak to a, to the to the system, can we sense it from your brain waves? Possibly. Do we want to do all these things? Is this totally, you know, related but different question? But again, it's, a, it's really kind of all about thinking what, about what we can do and where we want to work these things in. So a lot of new technology, a lot of different things that we can do, uh, and a lot of things that I'm excited about. I want to talk a little bit more um, about what kinds of experiences we can create and some of the underlying themes that might help us create great learning experiences, whether it's in the workplace, in a university or um, you know, for, for children or anything else or just in a lifelong learning kind of context. Okay, biggest thing really is keeping in mind that we're scaling up, right? That's one of the great things about technology. I, I talked, uh, one of the other talks a little bit about apprenticeships as an early model of education that worked really pretty well. You had an apprentice working with the expert. It was a one-on-one -on -one relationship. They had an expert coach. They learned by doing, they would practice, they would get feedback. They would kind of build up from simpler tasks to more complex tasks. They could have the expert helping them, so they would get it scaffolding. So a lot of educational theory, a lot of cognitive theory was, was sort of implicitly being addressed in that model. But that's a model that just doesn't scale up, right? You just don't have enough experts who have the time to work with the number of people who need to learn things, multiplied by the number of different things that they need to learn. Uh, even with technology connecting people, that can help in some ways, and that is one way to use technology. But we also want to look at things we can do that are environments that are more, um, at least significantly self-paced and, and give you more time on your own to try to do something that's interesting. And technology scales up really, really well. 
right? So if we build it right, if we build something, we build a, a great simulation experience and you know online or in a VR headset, and we run it on one person, it's the same, it's the same cost if it's gonna be a million or 10 million, um, other than you know hardware if it's if it's VR, but basically it's the same. And so that's one of the major advantages, and always I think something to keep in mind is that technology can scale up. Mass education kind of came about because of the need to scale up. The classroom model, well, we only have so many teachers. So we want to put a lot of students in the class with the teachers. But with technology, we can get that scalability without having to use um, you know, the systems that we have in the past. They have the roles, but they're not the only way to go. How about a little bit about user-centered design and what that means? Um, the picture on the screen right now is something that some of you might remember. This is a little MP3 player. It's one of the early MP3 players um, from 2001 uh, by a company called iRiver. And it's not a bad little device. I had one at one point. Um, it's useful for running. It's small. You can carry it with you. It's very, very portable. And you know, it plays MP3 files. You can play songs. So sort of at the, you know, at the generic level of does it check off all the features? You can play the songs. You can see um, information about the songs. You can carry it with you. Those are pretty good things. But it never really caught on. Uh, it was just kind of a you know just a niche product, and then the same year, the first um, the first iPod came out, and this really caught on. And you know at a glance, well, it's bigger, it's less portable. Hey, can you really run with that? Um, why did it catch on? There are a lot of reasons why this caught on. One was Apple produced an ecosystem that really made it work. So if you look back at the iRiver, um, and I had one, and no criticism to them, it was a really nice piece of technology, and I found it useful. But it required kind of a level of technical expertise and time to be able to use. So if I wanted to put files on this, on this little iRiver device on the left, which I did, because why else would I have it? So if I want to put some files on it, I would find a file online somewhere. It wasn't always clear where. Sometimes your friends would give it to you. More often, you would take your CDs and rip the MP3 file, because it wasn't really clear where else you'd find them. Or you'd get it from some place you know, that maybe you shouldn't be going. And I didn't like doing that, because of you know, computer virus worries. So there weren't that many choices, but I could take things, you know, still, it's portable music. I could rip my own CDs. That was good. You take your MP3s, you name the file so that you probably will remember what it was within the character limits of file names, like the name of the song title or something. Then you hook up this little iRiver player to your PC. It only works on PCs with a USB cable. And it looked like an external hard drive and you would copy files onto it. You would move the files on, you copy and paste or drag them over into the correct folder, and it had to be into the correct folder. And then you would disconnect it, and everything would work. And you would have a little screen, and you could kind of see the name of the, um, of the file that you're playing. And you could play the songs in order. So you got you know, maybe you know, 50 songs or so, and you could play them in order. So great. That was something. It was an accomplishment. But it wasn't enough for mainstream acceptance. What was was the iPod? Because from a design standpoint, you know, everybody talks about Apple products and how they're beautiful, and they often are. But this wasn't just the physical beauty; it was the entire setup. They had the ecosystem. You want a song, you would go to iTunes online and you would get the song. You want to put it on your iPod, you plug your iPod into your computer and it syncs automatically, and you have your song. You want to create a playlist, you can do that. You can do it on your computer where you have a keyboard, so that you don't have to try to do things in some other way. You can take advantage of the computer capabilities, make a playlist, bring it on to your iPod. And by the way, all of this seems like it's like 50 years ago, doesn't it? It's really less than 20, but it really seems like a long time ago. It feels very, it's feels almost the same way as when I was talking about radio before uh, to me. It just feels like it's so long, but it, this is how it worked. And this was a significant change at the time because it was well-designed, because the system was well-designed for the goals of the people using it. Right? You want to be able to play your music and understand what you're playing and play it in different ways and easily move around. And that's where the you know, little click wheel in the, um, it came in as well. So design is much, much more than the look. It's the entire conception based on goals of a product. And I think that's something we always want to keep in mind when we're designing learning of any kind, and particularly online learning, where it's always easy for the technology to kind of take the forefront as a constraint. And, Sometimes that can drive you in, the, in, in, in a direction that may not be uh, the one that we want. I'll we'll talk about another underlying theme uh, when it comes to design and thinking through what, what we can do, what we might want to do, what we can do. Um, this is a story about um, an academic study. 
And it is actually what it is the story about. There was a study done at Case Western Reserve University here in the US uh, in the late 90s. And in the study, people were asked to walk into a room that had a table with radishes, as you see on the left. We only have a plate, but it had, all, had lots of them. And on the other side was a lot of chocolate chip cookies. For most people, I don't want to overstay everybody, radishes are not a favorite snack. Chocolate chip cookies are a favorite snack. They are you know, almost universally considered to be appealing. Radishes are almost universally considered to not be something that you're really crazy about eating. So they asked people to go in the room, and there was a group of people that was asked to go in and eat the radishes while they were in the room with the cookies that they could not have. The happier group of people, as it turned out, um, was asked to go in the room and eat the cookies. They enjoyed themselves, I think, a lot more than the other one. So people went into this study, one, you know, they knew it was a study, but they, they didn't really know that exactly what was going to happen uh, because they were not told that the study was um, going to be what it was. Here's what happened. After they went through this little radish or cookie experiment, both groups then went to another room and they were given a very difficult problem to solve. It's really an unsolvable problem something you would just weren't ever going to get to. So they would keep trying, they would keep trying, they would keep trying. The people who had eaten the cookies gave it a lot more time than the people who had the radishes. The people who had the radishes quit problem solving significantly earlier than the people who had the cookies. Now, I, you know, one interpretation before they did some other studies could be that, you know, Chocolate chip cookies are good for energy, and that's a great lesson for us to learn. I don't think it's necessarily true, but it's a really nice lesson. I'm happy to take it. What the takeaway really was, was that resources are a sort of a, a, a quality that transcends a particular area, right? So the people who had expended resources fighting off the temptation to eat the cookies and forcing themselves to eat the radishes didn't have as much energy left to fight through this difficult problem. And the researchers at Case Western did um, more work on this and uh, found that this was sort of a, you know, a takeaway that seemed to hold up over time. So the takeaway really is the notion of resource limitation is general. So it's not just like, oh, I only have time for so much. You know, and you think about that in terms of time because you kind of do know that that's general, right? So in terms of time, you know, there's only so much. I have time for this. I have time for that. I don't have time for everything. And that's an issue too. When, so when it comes to designing online learning, we're often competing for resources, people are distracted, even if they're gonna finish a course that we've built or a product that we've built or a just-in-time performance work piece and use that, and so like finish it, but use it at the right times. You know, we want it to be something that's so compelling that people are going to get excited about it and they will devote resources to it. There are so many things competing uh, for everyone's time and resources right now. Now more than ever. Talk about some foundational edu educational concepts. I've talked a little bit about many of these throughout uh, the conference so far. Learning by doing, we've seen some examples. People learn really, really well by doing something. It's you know not by memorizing content and by taking a test on it, but by actually doing, put them in a situation where they can experiment and experience and learn. And ideally it's a, it's a situation where they can learn without necessarily real consequences, at least initially, especially if the potential real consequences are bad and dangerous. And it's a situation where they can also be encouraged to experiment. And that's uh, always worthwhile and harder and harder these days, but to get people to feel comfortable experimenting. And in the corporate world, that's always a challenge. If people feel like somebody's gonna know what I try, somebody's gonna know what I do. So, you know, if I'm in a customer service simulation and I decide to make a customer angry because it's fun and I know it's a real not a real customer and I would never do that, you know, not everyone's willing to do it, but there's still interesting things that come from experimentation. Also some consequences as we see on this slide. Situated learning. Um, there's a famous paper by Alan Collins and, John, and uh, a couple of people, John Seeler Brown and, and Paul Duguid in, in uh, 1989, on situated learning, meaning that learning is best done in context and that you learn things best when you are in the context where it's going to be useful. And that will also help you transfer things uh, to the actual job. They also studied authentic activities, the idea that, that you should be doing activities that are realistic and uh, particularly in workplace learning. Um, which is not exactly, the, the paper was not about that, but that's a conclusion I think we can safely judge, particularly in workplace learning, you're gonna put people in an environment and in a situation that is like what they're gonna do. So it's not, here are the 12 principles of customer service, and then you're magically supposed to go out and apply them. It's, let's put you in a situation where you learn to practice and employ. You may wanna know what the principles are and know what your goals are. You certainly wanna know that, um, but that you're learning by doing, 
in a realistic context. Another underlying concept is just-in-time performance support, and we've talked a little bit about that so far in this conference, and we will talk more. There's an interview with uh, Hal Christensen, a performance support uh, expert, coming up later this afternoon. And just-in-time performance support, meaning something that will help you just in time when you need it. It's still the case that the traditional model of education doesn't always transfer it all to the workplace. So, you know, we, people take a long training course, even if it's a great training experience, there are things you're going to learn that by the time you need them, you will have forgotten. Uh, or they think that you really just don't need to know because they're an exception case. Even, you know, relatively simpler jobs, it's a, it's a customer service job. Here's a particular situation. I don't know if I'm going to know how to handle that when it happens to me nine months from now. I may have handled it in a great training class, but, you know, in a great training simulation. But nonetheless, it's a lot to ask. And it's not necessarily the most efficient use of resources. People are spending time in training that doesn't need to be. Uh, questioning the relevance of things sometimes if they don't see how this is ever going to happen to them. And also, uh, you know, there's just an opportunity here, particularly more and more. We have mobile devices. We have all sorts of things to give you something that's going to help you do something just in time when you need it, whether it's look up information the way we do in Google, whether it's a decision aid where you're facing a situation and you want some advice. Hey, I'm in a complicated sales situation. The customer is objecting, even though, you know, objecting to our price, even though my price is better than that of our competitors. What do I do? You might be able to look something up. Uh, probably not if you're right there in front of the customer, but if you've got a little bit of, of, of time. So lots we can do with just-in-time performance support. And I've always felt it to be undervalued in the, uh, the workplace learning field. Another underlying concept and a related one is workflow learning, uh, learning in the context of the workflow. So this relates to situated learning and just-in-time performance support, because I think you often find that if you're learning something in the workflow, you're not necessarily having to learn it. So here, you know, we see people consulting a tablet as they're doing a task, and you know, that is, it's in the workflow and it is just in time. So it's really more performance support. And they will also learn it, however. So they may, next time they have the same situation, probably going to remember it. And they're probably not going to have to go back and look at it um, you know, again, or at least by the third time that you see a similar situation. So there's a lot, uh, lot we get out of that. Certainly, I want to forget about collaborative learning. I've talked a lot about self-paced kinds of uh, environments and skills that you would, you would need uh, there. There's an advantage to self-paced. You can do anytime, anywhere, and you don't need other people. But there's certainly a role for collaboration to try to build environments that foster the right, you know, the right kind of collaboration, get people in situations where they can work together um, not only practicing teamwork, but making the most and learning the most from each other is uh, is certainly a critical underlying theme. Next one, um, we talked about learning analytics and the idea of sort of intelligent analytics. I've talked a lot about that in this conference. Uh, love to see those, you know, not used as much as sometimes they are now. Where um, certainly Ryan Ryan uh, does is not guilty of this, but there are a lot of cases I've seen where the analytics are used more to predict, um, well, more to more to provide a performance. Uh, summary of someone. So more to give you an evaluation that is useful, but I'd rather use them uh, you know, more for good. I'd rather use them for personalized learning and to help the experience that you have be personalized to you. Create a coach component that's going to understand who you are and what you like and what's important to you and how you're comfortable learning and maybe where you can be pushed a little bit and where you shouldn't be pushed and when and how and all those things. And there are absolutely potential privacy concerns with these. None of these come up whenever I, I talk about it. But you know, they're, they're, those issues are something to deal with. Um, but on the other hand, there's a lot to be said for creating such a valuable experience. Keeping in mind, um, in the workplace, um, job performance is the goal. And that's, you know, always really what, you know, we're trying to perform better. We're trying to often change behavior, trying to get people to perform. And one way to do that is through learning. So sometimes it's through some kind of training. Sometimes it's through some other kind of learning. Another way is just-in-time support. So you may eventually learn how to do it, but really you're just getting helped to do the task while you're doing it. And a third, which is usually outside the scope of our world, is process improvement. So you might find, you know, sometimes you can't do that. Often as learning and development professionals, you're called in at a time when, you know, I would love to recommend a change to this process, but we can't do it. It's already rolled out. It's not our role, and that does happen. But if you can, and especially if it's within your own organization, sometimes processes can change, and that's another way um, to to keep uh, you know to keep changing and improving performance. And and that, in a certain sense, helps us keep track of the fact that job performance is the goal uh, at the end of it, and that's really the most important thing. Okay. Again, the goal is once again improve performance. 
So what makes for great learning experience? And this is a question um, that comes up kind of, uh, you know, kind of a lot. I've run a lot of seminars um, and asked people to share their stories about their best experiences they've ever had. Okay, so, I, you know, what are the most memorable and best learning experiences? I've done that in seminars, I've done that in classes. Um, here's someone who said that her most memorable experience was when her sister taught her how to drive a car. Okay, these, by the way, are not actually the real people. They are people uh, who resemble the real people uh, who told these stories. Another person had a different memorable experience about learning how to crochet from her aunt. Okay, so they worked together on that. And another one who had a childhood experience where he was on a great soccer, a great soccer team with a great coach and great teammates, and that was uh, really a, a, you know, just a memorable and great experience. You feel like you learned a lot. So all of these people told their stories. They they had certain certain key elements that came through. Okay, now. Corporate e-learning experiences aren't always as good. So here's some selected comments, and lots of there are obviously good ones, but I've heard these comments more often when I've gone into consult than I think I should. Uh, this guy, again, not quite this guy, but somebody like this guy, always waits to the last possible minute to do his e-learning. Okay, this is someone from the financial services industry. It's kind of a requirement. It's just like, okay, it's a chore. It's a deadline. I got to do it. I'm going to do it. Next person, he clicks through the pages as fast as possible to get to the test. Again, just wanting to get it done. Someone in retail. So again, so uh, you know, another um, one in retail. So, um, and the third person uh, just says e-learning is a waste of my time. So there's been a reputation that some e-learning has acquired, and you know, certainly not the e-learning done by the people at this conference. But there is still you know, a lot of the e-learning that's out there does tend to be kind of the page turning, test taking type, less than before, but still a lot out there. And you do see a lot of these. So there's again an opportunity to sort of change the perception by using technology in different and, and new ways. Okay, some of the stories people said, we, we, we saw um, some of the characteristics that came through of the great learning experiences. One was personal relevance. Uh, what does it mean to me? What is this, uh, you know, this has meaning to me? It's something I care about. Sometimes it was the person they were working with. Sometimes it was the content itself. Uh, feedback from the environment. So if you're learning to crochet, your answer is giving you feedback, but also the environment is giving feedback. You see if the stitches aren't right. If you're learning to drive a car, hopefully you're in a safe place because you're really going to get feedback from the environment. Feedback from the coach. So this is where the soccer coach, the aunt, and the sister in the examples that we gave are all uh, giving a lot of feedback from peers. And that's tremendously valuable. And there are you know, certainly ups and downs, but tremendously valuable um, to hear from other people on what you're doing. Um, and coaching in general, coaching guidance and feedback. So it's not just the feedback, but it's the guidance, somebody who's there to help you and somebody who's there conceptually and emotionally and who knows is there. Uh, another key one is the opportunity to fail. Uh, you get to experiment. It's a safe environment. You know, when, you, when you're learning to drive a car, at least the way I did, I learned how to drive in a parking lot, an empty parking lot. There was little damage I could do. There wasn't zero damage I could do. Fortunately, I did not do any damage. But, you know, it was minimal damage. You didn't learn to drive a car on a busy street. You could hurt a lot of people as well as yourself. And related to the opportunity to fail is the freedom to experiment. So there's sort of an underlying set of things that we really want to be able to do and think about how we can be uh, you know, creating the right kinds of experiences and the right kinds of environments for people. Learning by doing came up quite a bit. Competition comes up as one. Not everybody competes, but in the sports example, competition was a big one. And again, these don't all have to be in every environment, they're things to keep in mind. Modeling, uh, so modeling your own behavior, uh, particularly in the crochet example and in the sports example, that was valuable actually in the, in the driving one as well. All three people model their behavior after someone else. Maybe let me see somebody drive the car and show me, you know, when I'm supposed, where I'm supposed to put my hands on the wheel. Okay, now I'll do it. Okay, so it's a role that the coach can play, but it doesn't have to be the coach. So it's a good way to model your behavior. Appreciation by someone else is another one. Uh, interaction with a charismatic teacher or expert. Uh, and learner control is uh, another, another one they felt they wanted to have control. So you are looking for expert advice. You're looking for someone who's doing, who knows how to do something that you have not done before. And that's why you're learning. But people wanted to have control and not simply be told what to do. And those are all tend to be, you know, characteristics that come through frequently in people's great educational experiences. Uh, last one, this is a clear relevance between uh, the learning and the, and the real life task. And another thing, like, you know, you always get asked, why, why are we learning this? And to see the relevance always helps when you can do it. So what can we do next in this field? What can we do? Um, and 
you know, that's a question that we ask ourselves frequently, like what is it that we can you know, do with technology to improve the experiences that people have? So lots of different kinds of experiences. Um, I have a different way of looking at learning technologies than, than maybe I've seen some of the other places. I, I tend to look at learning technologies and people see learning theory and technology and they think learning technologies is the intersection of that. And so you can kind of take education and move it online. And, you know, particularly in these times of the pandemic, a lot of people had to do that. That's all you can do in the time that you had. But to me, it's a lot more than that. Um, you know, we have learning theory. We have technology and computer science. We have user experience design. We have cognitive science and how do people think and learn. Uh, and we take all of these and other areas too, you know, motivational theory, all of this kind of goes in there. And to me, that's learning technology. What we're looking at is being the creators of learning technologies, technologies that particularly support learning. So not simply adapting old learning models to a technology, but looking at it fresh and looking at what we can do with a certain technology. So let's walk through a potential future learning experience. Uh, this is um, one that some of you saw some of yesterday, if you're with me in the morning yesterday. Uh, potential learning experience, this is a student and he wants to study ancient Greece. And he's in his room in this imaginary world. And instead of having to do anything, he simply can um, push a button. And there he has ancient Greece right there for him to see. And he might ask questions. Is that the Acropolis? Well, who might he be asking? Well, he could be asking other friends that are logged on or colleagues or experts. He also could be asking an AI coach. And so in this case, I have an AI coach who says, yes, it is. And there are actually a number of buildings known as an Acropolis. Um, this one is the Acropolis with a capital T and the capital A, and it's the one that you know. But there are several, and this is one of them. So you know, you have an AI coach who is, again, theoretically, this is a step beyond what we can exactly do today, at least in a, in a general context, but um, be able to answer his question and be able to answer it in a, you know, in a natural and friendly way. Right? So it's a natural and helpful way. So it's natural language, uh, really feeling you know, as realistic as can be. Uh, he might want to know, our student here asked, did the Acropolis always look the same over the years? Let's look at this now. And she said, well, we don't really know what it looked like before the Archaic Era. Um, let's talk about one major tradition this you might find interesting. When Pesistratus built his entry gate, take a look. So she can decide, hey, you know what? You might want to see this. And he could say, thanks. He could say, I'm not interested. Um, in this case, he wants to know who Pesistratus was, and we learn uh, who that was, who was the son of Hippocrates, and we learn a little bit more about him and when he lived, and we see what he looks like, um, at least somewhat. Okay. And he can make some comments. Again, it's just kind of the other thing, you know, one of the goals, I think, is for people to feel that they're in a comfortable, natural learning environment, right? So kind of take and capture a lot of what people got out of learning to drive from their, you know, with their sister and playing on a great soccer team, and, you know, put that put that in the technology so that people really can experience that in lots of different ways when they want, anywhere they want, covering any area that they want. And that's a very ambitious goal. And you know, we aren't going to try to do that by the end of this week, but it is, I think the direction we wanna be going in and that a lot of the principles from this can come back into our everyday lives and some of them already are. So suppose he left the virtual world, visited Greece today, is actually there. He might have the AI coach with him in augmented reality. So she could still point out and say, hey, you know what? You remember when we saw this? You know, remember we saw how this used to look? It still pretty much looks like that, but here's what's changed. Remember the history. So, so many different things you can do uh, and a lot of different ways we can take advantage of this. He also could have his friends with him, either online, so he might have friends who he was exploring ancient Greece with, and he can say, hey, I'm here in Greece. What do you guys want me to look at? Um, they could join him. They could join him through a camera <laughs> so they can look themselves. You know, the, the possibilities are endless. And they're limited only uh, by creativity, they are limited to some degree by technology, but you know, we have a lot of technology too, and there are plenty. There's plenty left to do, but a lot of technology we can do different things with. So, what are some key elements of this experience? Uh, it was experiential learning in a very realistic context, um, coaching guidance, feedback from a coach and from peers, learner control, but again, the learner is assisted and advised. It was an immersive, personalized experience, and we could have added more learning by doing too. It wasn't really asked to do anything other than explore, and it's you know that seemed right for this particular example. Uh, so a lot we could we could do now. Learning by doing seems much more necessary for the next example. So suppose our student 
isn't only a student. He's also got to get a job. He's got to make a living, has to make some money, has to support, you know, at least his, at least his, uh, you know, time in college, at least his, his nights out, something. So he works retail. So here he is walking into his retail training room, which is a projected training room. So it projects a store. So here he is now in his retail training in this imaginary world in a store, and he's got to help this customer. And so he says, as she's looking at something, he jumps in and says, hey, can I help you find something? And the AI coach, though, is paying attention. Well, make sure you smile and look friendly. So the AI coach knows that, you know, might know whether he's smiling or not. That's something we could theoretically know for monitoring your face. And again, there are privacy issues, probably particularly with that. Um, she can also know his tone if he's speaking out loud. Uh, customer is there, so he's got some coach help. Okay, all right, so customer says, yes, do you have this in a size small? He says, I'm sure we do, he's gonna check. So we jump to the end. This could go on following sort of some of the, the things that we've seen uh, in other simulations, but in a much more in-depth way and with the AI coach jumping in more and providing more advice. At the end, the AI coach can tell you how well you did. Uh, facial expressions maybe in this case weren't his thing. He kind of said the right things, but he didn't really look the way he needs to look. He didn't seem as warm as he should be, as he could be. Uh, and she gives him in this case some uh, feedback numerically on wording, tone, facial expressions, and overall customer satisfaction. So there are, you know, there are questions. Do we, you know, do we want the numbers? Do we not want the numbers? Do we simply want it to be qualitative feedback? I think every case is different. There are different situations, um, but we do want whatever we're doing to be able to provide personalized and nuanced feedback. And we have a lot of data that we can use to do that if we do the right things with it. Key elements of this experience, experiential learning, uh, once again, in a realistic context, learning by doing results in skill transfer to the job, coaching guidance, coaching feedback, again, from a coach and potentially from peers, although we didn't see the peers in this one. Um, a realistic performance-based assessment and evaluation. So we, you know, one thing that often comes up is how do you measure people's performance uh, in, a, in some kind of training experience or on the job? In a training experience, they tend to do it by giving you questions, asking you to answer them. That's the easiest thing to evaluate. And we want to do something better than that, right? He may be great at memorizing the principles of customer service and telling you which one of the following is not a principle of customer service, but he might not be good at doing the actual job. This kind of um, performance-based assessment, if we use a similar thing to assess his performance, as we kind of showed here, uh, would work well for that. And again, learners under, you know, has control, but has assistance and advice from the experts. And this is very immersive and very personal. One more example. Um, here's a workplace example that's just in time. So it's not training, it's just in time. It's, it's support, it's performance support as you need it. So suppose we're in a veterinarian's office and we are looking at this from the perspective of a veterinarian and we have a dog waiting for us on our examination table. I'll leave that for another second because everybody wants to take, you know, likes to watch the dog. So whenever there's a dog, I'm totally with you. We all want to watch the dog for an extra second. Um, so we're going to do that. And we're in the middle of, a, of you know, our exam. And the AI coach might come in and say, you know, based on information from the sensors, so there are sensors in my operating table. Well, how about or my exam table? It's not operation. So there are sensors in my exam table. That's pretty cool. You might want to check a right back paw to see if there's a cut there. Okay, so that's something that we could do technologically. And this could pop up on, I may be looking at a screen. I may be wearing... You know, the successor to Google Glass, it may be something simpler than that, but any of these that could work. So we've got something monitoring and saying, you know, here's something you might want to know. I'm still in control. I'm the veterinarian in this case, but the AI coach is really, really helpful and has information that I don't have right at my fingertips. It's monitoring information. It's a much better use of resources. I don't, I'm not always checking all the sensors. Okay. So here's the later part, later in the exam, holding the dog a little closer. Uh, a colleague comes up, and this could be a real colleague or an AI colleague. So we could go either with this. This could be either one of those. I think I see a spot on her ear. I'm not sure if uh, you know I should be concerned about it. Um, and then the uh, oncologist colleague comes up and says, "Well, I biopsy this just to be safe, but it's probably not anything to worry about." Okay, a lot of different things we could do. Key elements of this experience: just-in-time performance support when we need it, uh, coaching guidance in real time. Integrating sensors, other technology into the experience, real-time collaboration with colleagues, um, and all kinds of things. So a couple of things before I close and have time for questions. Um, 
you know, there's an expression, necessity is the mother of invention, which has always been true. Um, you know, there's a need, people come up with a creative way to meet the need. But we need to see now, sometimes invention is the mother of necessity. And that works the other way. There's a, certainly a need for new approaches. But if you look at getting back to sort of the, the iPod, in this case, the iPhone, you know, Steve Jobs didn't really necessarily look at focus groups. In fact, Apple said they did not really look at, you know, what does everybody want? But he saw that this was something he could create and that Apple could create that would be useful and that people would find useful if they did it right. So there's, you know, sometimes there's a, you know, the need to create and invent something. Um, and you, the need is there when people realize that it exists and when the, the product exists. I think the same is true with a lot of the work that we do, that it's not so much always following what's been done before, but you think about what can we do? And it's like, you know, nobody's saying in any of the conversations I've had with clients or, or anyone, I, I never hear what I really need is an AI experience. What I really need is a virtual world that I can jump into. But, you know, if you think about what this could be, you can imagine how it would, would work and then how you can position it to people. And the goals that they have are achieved by the experiences that we want. So you do hear what the goals are, you just don't necessarily hear what the design would be. And that's really, that's often, and typically is gonna be our role, those of us in the industry. So to wrap up, a couple of key points. You know, just again, love to design new experiences that make the most of new technologies. As they keep coming more and faster to think about how do we re-envision, how do we reimagine, how do we think this is a time of change now more than ever, and what can we and should we do differently rather than doing the same old thing? I certainly have a group here who's done a lot of that. So I know I'm uh, you know, not the only one in this uh, virtual room um, who's, who's thought about this for, for quite some time. Uh, active learning and situated learning principles are a tremendous value. Learn in context, learn realistically. Uh, Just-in-time learning and performance support are key. So that's another one that's always, uh, Always, always true, I think, you know, this to not overtrain, particularly in the workplace, but to think about other things that we can do. When do you really need training? When do you need something just in time? When is it a mix uh, of things? We had a, a product once that was um, for a retail client where it was a mix of, it was, just in, it was a just-in-time performance support product to help um, the people who manage the cashiers and some other people do their jobs better and more efficiently. And some of the things that you would find when you searched for answers were really quick. Like, okay, I'm having a little trouble with my cash registers. What do we do? All right, here's how you troubleshoot. One, two, three. But sometimes it was, you know, my team is being consistently slow. What can I do? Okay, well, here's something you can do in text, but then here's a five minute training piece or a 10 minute training piece that you might want to go through or positioned as a 10 minute video that you want to watch or some other kind of experience so that you can, or a two minute video so that you can go through and and learn something you might want to do. So there's a lot of different ways that performance support and training can, can blend together. Uh, it's a great way of experiences that are immersive, relevant, that are personalized, um, and those tend to result in the learner emotionally connecting to the experiences. And I think that's a, a key point. You know, there's, there's sort of a, a reputation that a lot of traditional education has as if it's a chore, it's something you're told to do from the time you're at a young age. This is, well, you go, you go because you have to. Even people who really enjoy learning sometimes get themselves, find themselves in learning experiences that they don't enjoy. So they may enjoy learning in general, but they don't enjoy that particular learning experience. And the more, in my view, that we build experiences that follow these principles, the more that we're gonna be able to have people feeling that learning is a natural outgrowth of what they're doing. It's something that they have control over. It's something that they enjoy. It's an area where they feel respected. It's all of those things. They can pursue their interests. They certainly are things that they should become familiar with and will be asked to, but it's not the same take a step, do what you're told uh, kind of model that, that it still is, is way too prevalent in these days. Okay, I'd say in the end, it's all about the experience. So I'll close with a quick quote. This is Isaac Asimov, a famous writer. Published something in uh, the end of 1983, predicted the world of 2019. So we are now just past that. And this quote was, you know, education, which must be revolutionized in the new world, as you can see on the screen, um, will be re revolutionized by the computer. There'll be an opportunity for every youngster, every person to learn what he or she wants to learn in this, you know, everything in their own way, at their own time. Education will become fun because it will bubble up from within and not be forced in from without. And, you know, I think that's all still true today. And it's still true that you know, certainly some of the experiences we see are like that. The ones we're seeing here are like that, but so much that 
is out there is not like that. And what we want to do is look at how we can make an impact on a large scale so that education feels the way that he described it feeling uh, for everyone. So the training and learning development feel that way in the workplace and that you feel emotionally connected, you feel that it's relevant, and you feel respected and it's something that you sort of do naturally and naturally enjoy. And on that, um, I will wrap up. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, be with me over the past, uh, you know, past 45 minutes or so, a little more. And I've got a little bit more time left for questions. So if we have questions, uh, please go ahead and put them in the, uh, put them in the chat. Anything else we can talk about? Uh, and I can't ask myself questions. So, so anything you have, please go ahead and, and put it in the chat. And, uh, Give a minute for anything to show up, and while we're while we're waiting to see if there are qu further questions, um, you know, getting back to the learning performance support product I was talking about before, um, you know, one of the interesting things this was as I mentioned this was for a retail client. This, it's a product that was out for for a number of years and and uh, started back in the early '90s, and so it was just in time learning. Uh, in in sort of all the all the ways that that um, that you might want, and I do have. Well, now I have more. Now I have questions, so I will I will save the rest of that for later. Um, how can emotions be linked to experience? And Fernando asked, and that's a really good question. And I think you know I agree with Ryan that there's a lot of work to be done in the sort of affective area um, on the psychology side. But there's at the very least there's something to you put people in a realistic experience, and they're going to tend to feel that it's much more enjoyable than sitting and being told what to do. You give people interesting and challenging tasks and personalize them and they'll feel better about it. So there's a level there at the very least of emotional connection that I think is a step, you know, is a step toward what we want. I think we can do much, much more and, and Fernando's own work, um, you know, I think really has, I think Fernando, if you have a chance to ever measure, you know, is there a, a time that people were in a, you know, non-simulation environment and, how they thought about it relative to how they were in one of your simulations, um, you know, it'll be interesting to to be. Um, next question from 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 Christina. So um, her comment is that her twenty something year old learners, as well as her forty plus year old learners, um, say that interacting with a screen feels frustrating and ineffective. Do I think learners are ready for the new education? Will they need to change their mindset? It's a great question, and you know, I think. It's a challenge, and that it's somewhat controllable. And so, there certainly are complexities in any kind of change, and people are used to what they're doing. I think one of the barriers to people getting comfortable with this kind of AI component, or with some of the things that we see online, is that it's not really natural yet. It's not designed well for you. So, I think that you know, it's you know, it's it's the iRiver MP3 of learning, right? So, it's there. It kind of has the right features. It's a step but it's not quite there. And that when we build the right kinds of products that people will, you know, not against never everybody, but start to feel a level of comfort and things can become more mainstream. And we kind of see that with other technologies. So VR, as Michelle pointed out, VR seems like it's not, you know, to a lot of people, it's not mainstream yet. You know, am I gonna really wear this headset? And said, well, how, how was it with your students? And she said, they all thought it was great. They didn't have any problem with it. And that's not everyone yet, but it's becoming more and more mainstream. Um, Patrick asked if it has to be VR or AR to make it immersive, are there other, poss other possibilities? Uh, two things, number one, I don't think it has to be. Um, you know, I think some of the online video things we've done are, are, are pretty immersive. You know, you, you watch Ray and Jane, you get really absorbed into the story and you find yourself immersed in it. There are interface things we can do online to make people do that. It's not as immersive, but it, it certainly can be. Um, and I think we wanna take those techniques anyway. And you know, if you have something that's, 80 or 90 percent immersive, however one defines that. That's uh, you know a lot better than 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 zero or ten. Uh, and that also, you know, as we see other technologies, we'll see holograms or another one. We start to see projections as we did with Fernando, and um, you know that's another that's another area. Um, and jumping down, comments about game mechanics and gamification, uh, which I think is a a big question about. Yeah, gamification, not playing games, is engaging learners. And Don, I'm glad you brought up gamification. Um, I mean, gamification is a word that I feel like maybe got a kind of funny reputation and not necessarily undeserved, but it could be more than that, right? So, you know, there's sort of this idea that you gamify a learning experience by taking an existing learning experience and putting a game on top of it. And, um, you know, usually that's not gonna work, right? You know, the old example we used to use, my old advisor used to use in the, in the late 80s was, um, 
when Space Invaders was still around as a video game that people remembered was, was something about shooting down verbs. There were, this, there were these products out where people would learn, theoretically learn language by looking at verbs and shooting them down in sort of a little, little video game. And that wasn't particularly useful from an educational standpoint, right? The game might have been fun, as fun as anything is, but the, you know, the, um, there was no connection between shooting things down and learning how to use your verbs correctly or knowing what they were. So that was game, a game with no purpose. We see, you know, if you have to memorize things, playing Game of Jeopardy is probably more fun than simply sitting in a room by yourself, um, you know, memorizing it. But is memorization really the right thing? Is memorization going to get you any closer to any of your goals? And those are questions, um, you know, that, you know, those are, yeah, I think our answer is always, there's a lot more to that. Um, the more you can build, I would say, the gamification and the game elements into the products, uh, the better off. We are on Activist Screen to show, which I have to read later, but during my 305 talk, there's an old screen I can show you that um, is, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a work, it's a simple workplace task with some game elements, but the game elements are real. It's, you're, you're, you're doing the real task. You're not playing an artificial game, you're doing the real task. And um, that's kind of where I think we want to be going with gamification and it's not, just about, and sometimes not at all about badges and, and challenges and who reaches the top of the ladder. And I don't know that those are really the ideal things to do, but to think about the game-like elements that can make things really, really enjoyable and fun for people and build them in, but build the realism and the game parts together. Uh, and I think that's where I'd like to see. And, and I'm glad you agree with that. Um, Fernando asked about engaging students with um, actors, uh, interacting with them from screens or big, walls in Ariel, per, perhaps. Uh, absolutely, that's, I, they, I mean, those are very much learning by doing, learning by feeling immersed in, I mean, it's a tremendous level of immersion, uh, learning by, uh, you know, putting yourself in a realistic situation, um, you know, even within the room that you're in. And I think, you know, what I would love to see is when you know, we get one step closer and, you know, you can do the really high end e-real experiences and not have to be in the, uh, you know, in the room. And that's one, you know, we'd like to get there. Um, so Christina asks, uh, who'll be able to afford this type of education? That's another, that's a, that's a great question that I would love to have a good answer for. And I think that's a critical point. You know, one of the advantages that I see um, aspirationally of doing this kind of learning because it can scale up is that more and more of it becomes accessible to anyone, right? So I talked earlier this morning, for those of you here this morning, um, about, which was yesterday, talked yesterday, actually, this I did not talk about this morning. Yesterday afternoon, I did talk this morning, but I spoke yesterday afternoon about an experience I had in fifth grade where we had uh, a great learning experience in which you were learning about the state governments in the US by doing very constructivist exploratory learning and you know, making phone calls to the state governments and writing letters and putting together a scrapbook. And some of those principles are, you know, just by and large, just good education principles, but those aren't what you would see in every school. I was fortunate enough to go to a school that did that and it was very labor intensive. We had a great teacher who would do that. She couldn't teach everywhere. We only had 15 people in the class. If we had 40 or 100, could we have done that project? I probably not. But with technology, we have the opportunity to build experiences that scale up. And I think we want to kind of continue to rethink the role of the teacher, the role of the professor, the role of the expert. And, you know, the flipped classroom approach, which we've seen, certainly does a lot of that. Like you're not being talked at, you're doing something educationally, and then you're using the, the person who's the expert more as a mentor and expert. And if some of that is AI, all the better, then it scales up. So it is always a challenge where there are things that are, you know, progressing that are not yet affordable. And I would really like to find a solution to that because I think one of the big advantages is that this will make um, things more accessible to people. And that's kind of one of the one of the goals that we have um, societally and worldwide. I'm not sure I have a, a full answer for that, but um, at the very least, you know, if we build, even using the technology that we have, building more immersive online environments that run on, you know, a, a, a laptop or even or on a tablet would at least reach the majority of people, uh, for example, right? Like I know Patricia was talking yesterday about uh, the limitations in Brazil right now. Not everybody has laptops and, and what they're working with in terms of, of mobile phones and tablets, but they do have some technology. So suppose we built an immersive learning environment and it was a simulation and people had the opportunity to 
um, learn something valuable by practicing in that environment and it worked on a laptop and a tablet, would we reach everybody? We wouldn't reach everybody, but we could reach a lot more people. And theoretically, that would be something um, that was more affordable. So those are uh, some of my thoughts on that. And, and you know, as I see this conference throughout the rest of the time um, and throughout the, the next uh, rest day and a half, you know, these are issues I'd love to keep talking about. Uh, and many of our speakers cover issues um, along these lines as well. And, and almost everything that we talk about here kind of plays into it some level, whether it's a production aspect or whether it's a high level conceptual aspect or anything else. What is it that can we do? How do we do things differently? How do we do things in a way that's affordable, accessible to everyone and produces the kinds of experiences that we want and does it and, you know, and, and allows us to work to do so in an efficient way. And that's kind of what we're, I think, trying to do over the course of the time here.